plank. My name is Kailash Sakar. When I was five or six years old, on the very first day that I went to my new school, I found a cobbler and his son sitting right on the doorstep of my school. They were cleaning, polishing children's shoes, and I was carrying new books and a new bag. Wearing a new uniform, everything was new. As soon as I entered the school, I felt a lot of joy and happiness. But I saw that child, and I stopped a while because it was my first encounter like that. And I thought, why would a child my age be sitting and polishing shoes for children like me while I was going to school? I wanted to ask this question for a while, but I didn't have enough courage. So I entered the classroom, and my teacher welcomed me. I did not ask this question, though. I still had the feelings in my heart that I should. A couple of hours later, I collected my courage and I asked my teacher, why is this child who was my age sitting on the doorstep and cleaning shoes? And he looked at me strangely and said, what are you asking? Do you, think you have come to study here not for all these unnecessary things to this question. It's not your business. Well, I was a little angry. I thought that I should go home and ask these questions to my mother. And I asked her. She said, not seen many working children. Well, it is their destiny. They are poor people and they have to work. I was told not to worry about it. One day I went to the father of the boy, the cobbler, and I said, I watch this boy every day and I have a question. Why don't you send your child to school? Well, the father looked at me for two minutes before he answered, and he slowly replied, I am untouchable. School. Where does that come from? I mean, who should I ask? The teacher had no answer. My mother had no answer. Even the cobbler had no answer. And nobody had a good answer. Well, I carried that in my heart for years, and now I am doing something about this. Five million children in India alone are born into slavery. Small children of six, seven years, forced to work 14 hours a day. They cry for their parents. They are beaten severely, sometimes hanged upside down in the trees, and branded the number of children are growing up parallel to the growth of exports. The export of carpets go up and the children in the service unit go up and up. So we conduct consumer campaigns and direct action, secret raids that free those children and return them to their families. But when you free them, the work has just begun. Speak truth to your heart. Like the palm of my hand, 
and the only thing you could see was a scar, like a stitch, and just a little hole. That's it. No lips, nothing. Kakia. I said, you live with this? And she said, all my life. I cry all the time when I see it. I cry inside. I feel weak. I feel defeated all the time. And I looked at her and saw the strongest woman on earth. Outside, you can't really tell that she's suffering. She's the most loving person I've ever met. She made me stay. She made me stay and win my case. Speak truth to power. students from harassment, and if they do not, they can be individually sued, just like a doctor from malpractice. I have always said that I don't care why people do the right thing just as long as they do the right thing. Be true to the came back 
ability and the opportunity to, um, to become heroes and to muster that courage inside themselves when they're reading these works. And uh, Speak Truth to Power is now an education initiative. It's a 12-week long course that students take um, around the world. There are uh, about, well, well over 500,000 students will take it this year alone. Um, and I want to introduce John Heffernan standing here because he is the director of the Speak Truth to Power program. Um, and I want to say a special thanks to Sheila and Chris Kennedy who are here uh, because one of the programs we're doing with Speak Truth to Power is bringing it to Chicago in April. And that's going to be an incredibly special program. We spent um, three days last summer with 30 uh, Chicago public school teachers and we wrote new chapters of Speak Truth to Power, one on each of the living Nobel Peace Prize winners. And those are now being taught to students across the Chicago public school system. And when the, in April, all of the Nobel laureates are going to come to Chicago, they're going to fan out across the city, and they're going to interact with those students, the high school students who have been reading this play and studying the, the defenders. But it doesn't stop there. The heart of the Speak Truth to Power program is called the um, a defender, and that's where we give students a toolkit for action, and we train them in becoming human rights defenders, and our goal is at the end that they self-identify as human rights defenders. And what we found is across the board, when students take that case, that course, and go through the training, that it changes their entire attitudes about themselves and their place in the world, and their place in community. And it um, diminishes bullying, and it brings up their grades, and it creates a, a sense of, um, of wonder and delight and uh, possibility in their schools. So that's that's a, one of the ma major programs of the RFK Center. I needed to get to a pharmacy. 
And the, the closest pharmacy is a seven hour walk. So I left with my wife and our two year old at 1 a.m. and we walked down town and we got here at 8 a.m. but the pharmacy was closed. So then um, there were a few other people there and Abel explained that, that his team had been working with them to help them decide what they wanted, what are their priorities. And they had said what they really wanted was a school. And so after months and months of training, 15 of them trained, came down, talked to the mayor, walked down that house seven hours, talked to the mayor and said, we want a school. The mayor said, okay, we'll get you a school. Do you have a building? And they said, no, we don't have a building. He said, well, you go buy, build a building and come back. So it took them a year because they don't have any money. They built the building. They walked down into town. They talked to the mayor. They said, we've got the building. He said, well, do you have desks and chairs for all the students? And they said, no, we don't have that. So they went back six months later. They came back and said, we want a, we want a, you know, we want a teacher. Well, do you have a desk and a chair for the teacher? No, they didn't have that. So three months later, they come back and they have the desk for the teacher. And they say, we want a want a teacher, he sends them a teacher who is a part-time housekeeper, barely literate, and can't speak their language. So they come back down the mountain and they say, look, everywhere else in Mexico, the government gives the building and the teacher and the, and the books and everything else, and we want a real teacher. He said, okay, we'll send you a teacher. And two weeks later, all 15 were rounded up and accused of murder. One of them spent two years in prison. Several of them spent a year in prison. Um, and a few spent a few months in prison. And then a guy came forward and said, look, I was told that if I didn't accuse them that my wife and my children would be murdered. And so, uh, but the truth is he had nothing to do with the murder at all. These people had nothing to do with the murder at all. And so they were released from prison. But three of them, had never been picked up. And so they were with us that day. And they said, you're going to meet with the prosecutor tomorrow, and will you please ask them to drop the charges against us? So we said, sure. So we go and meet with the prosecutor. We go through the whole story. And the prosecutor says, look, you don't understand. The US system is different from the Mexican system. And we can't just drop charges like that. But you tell them to come on in and they won't spend more than three days, probably, in jail, and we'll get it all sorted out. Oh, my goodness. So this, this is the reality that Abel is dealing with every single day. And the RFK Center is, um, which we do with all of our human rights and work laureates, partnering with him intensively for the next six years to help him get to a place to more able to confront these human rights violations. So in the, in the last few months since we've been working with them, the woman's case um, has gone before the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, and, uh, and they've demanded that the government of Mexico um, uh, bring her case out of military court and into civilian court where she's got a chance of getting justice. So, and, and that will have implications for all of the other abuses committed by the military against people in that region. Um, we got a pharmacy to open and, and help us in. Uh, and we're working with the GO campaign to, to help that community um, build a, now they have schools, so they want a health care clinic, so we're helping them do that. But that's just to, to give you sort of a, a small sense of the type of work we do. We can't do this alone. We're a very small organization, and the way we are effective is calling upon our friends. And we get people to come and help us lobby. We get people to come and help us on those trips. We get people to give of their time and their effort and treasure and energy and their imaginations. And we get these incredible actors to help us as well. And so if you're interested in bringing speak truth to power to your schools. If you're interested in helping us on our core work, um, we would love to hear from you and we'd love to get you involved. And, uh, and I want to, again, thank everybody for coming and go out and